Ladies and gentlemen, uh, for those of you who have um, joined us at this point in time, uh, welcome to the second of uh, the uncontrolled uh, aerodrome uh, operations webinar that um, that CASA has organised along with um, our uh, industry participants. Uh, just a couple of uh, housekeeping issues prior to uh, commencing. We will be recording this um, this webinar this afternoon as we did on the first one that we ran and the webinar will be uh, or the recording will be placed into the new pilot safety hub that CASA have commissioned which is uh, now available for um, industry to look at. I just had a, um, a message there that um, someone couldn't hear me. Uh, can you hear me um, Landy? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, thank you. So whoever that was that um, said they, they can't hear me, the issue is quite likely uh, at your end. See what you can do, make sure your volume's up and um, your um, headphones working. Yep, thank you. So yeah, so the, 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 the webinar this afternoon will be um, recorded and uh, that will be placed into the new uh, Pilot Safety Hub. Um, and I'll give you a URL address to that uh, at the end of the presentation. Um, secondly, um, we'll, uh, we'll introduce to you um, the presenters shortly, but first of all, um, if uh, you'd like to ask a question at any time during or after each of the uh, presenters have finished their presentations, um, you could raise your hand. You do that just by going to the top menu bar and uh, there's a little reactions icon with a little hand there. If you just left click onto that, it'll raise your hand. Um, and then if you want to lower your hand, you just re-click on the same uh, icon or image and your hand will come down. Uh, alternatively, uh, that's if you would like to ask a question uh, by voice. Um, alternatively, if you prefer not to do that, um, then you'll be able to um, uh, place a question in writing into the chat column just by going down to the bottom right of the, um, the chat column. After you've clicked on the chat bubble at the top, that'll open the column up for you and you can type in a, a question there for any one of the presenters uh, and we will, will either respond to that verbally or uh, someone will type an answer to your question uh, into the chat column and everyone will be able to uh, see uh, the question uh, and the respective answer that's uh, placed into that. Uh, so that is the um, uh, the, the housekeeping um, issues. We'll, we expect to go for around a, a about uh, an hour uh, thereabouts, maybe a, a little bit more this afternoon. Um, and um, I'll, I'll begin the the, the introduction. So uh, my name is Michael White. I'm an aviation safety advisor, currently the acting team leader for the uh, safety advisors within uh, CASA. I work out of the CASA Melbourne office and assisting me is Terea Miller. Terea is uh, one of our aviation safety advisors and a Terea operates out of the Canberra office, generally covers uh, New South Wales. I cover uh, both Victoria and down through uh, Tasmania. Uh, with us today, we have, uh, as you can see on the screen there, Andrew Learmonth. Andrew is a Captain and Fleet Safety uh, Investigator uh, with Qantas Link. So Andrew will be providing us with uh, his presentation at Ops at uh, Non-Controlled Aerodromes. We have then, uh, following that, Ben Van Dongen from uh, Virgin. Ben is the Boeing 737 Fleet Training Manager with Virgin and also assisting Ben is Scott Mitchell. Scott's the Air Traffic and Meteorology Manager for, uh, for Virgin um, and they'll be um, uh, giving us their presentation this afternoon. Uh, then followed by Jill Bailey. Jill's Head of Flight Operations with uh, uh, Recreational Aviation Australia. Jill will be giving us a presentation on uh, uh, operating um, or RAOs operations followed by uh, Cody Calder. Cody is the Head of Safety for Recreational Aviation Australia and Cody will be giving us a, a particular um, presentation on the safety aspects of uh, Recreational Aviation Australia. 
So that's essentially the order of business. We'll start with uh, Qantaslink this afternoon, followed by Virgin and RAOs. At the end of each of those presentations, I'll, uh, uh, if you have any questions, you could raise your hands or alternatively, as I said, place them into the, the chat column. Um, and if we have any there, uh, we will put those to the presenter for that particular um, segment. I also have a couple of questions that have been sent in um, prior to the uh, seminar this afternoon, and I'll uh, select uh, some of those to put to the um, presenters as well um, to uh, attempt to get an, uh, an answer for you. Uh, and at the end of the uh, the presentations, um, we will have a general Q and A session if we have um, if we have the time to do that. Following that, uh, I'll summarise and. Um, uh, point you towards the CASA resources that we've um, just commissioned onto the, the, the pilot uh, safety hub. And then thank you and we'll um, end and, and close the meeting following that. So I think without further, um, without delay, I might um, introduce you to uh, Andrew Learmonth from uh, Qantaslink. Uh, over to you. Um, thank you, Andrew, for your presentation. Thanks, Michael. Good day, everyone. Uh, just before I get, get started, I think there's a few people just struggling to to get audio looking, looking at the chat. Um, can you hear me okay there, Michael? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Great. Um, Ray or anyone else? Yeah, did, did you just want to pass on a little bit of advice before I get cracking? Yeah, if everyone just wants to, those that are having trouble with their uh, sound, possibly unmute the mic at the top. Uh, just next, across the top, you've got your um, various diagrams across the top. Leave is on the bot is the far right to across and that's Mike. Just push on that to make sure it doesn't have a line across it. Um, also check the volume on your own computer. So normally down the bottom on the right hand side of your own screen, uh, there's the little um, I guess speaker to make sure that that's loud enough. Um, if there's any other issues, it might be easier just to log out and try logging back in if all those others haven't worked uh, yet. So uh, see how you go and let's. Uh, Oh, good. Okay, quite a few of you can hear all right. All right, well, there's a couple that are having trouble. Maybe try logging out and logging back in if your mic is uh, already unmuted. Thanks for that. I've um, I've just shared my screen as well. And yeah, just, just double checking, Michael, you've got that. And you can still hear me okay? Yep, perfect. Excellent. Uh, g'day. And yeah, thanks, thanks, Michael, for the introduction. And g'day, everyone. Um, my name's Andrew Learmonth. I'm a um, Q Finder captain at Qantas Link and also work as a fleet safety investigator uh, within the, the Qantas group. Um, here today to talk about yeah managing in-flight separation at non-towered aerodromes and I guess just to start as a little bit of background spent pretty much all my aviation career operating in and out of non-towered aerodromes. Um, I've spent the last seven years at Qantas Link uh, flying to Dash 8s but before that flew ATRs for Virgin for a few years, um, did night freight in metros and uh, before that did the GA which included being a grade one flying instructor so uh, a fair bit of time in and out of uh, CTAFs or non-towered aerodromes and it's I guess it's given me a really good appreciation of I guess uh, the different sides of the fence and the different perspectives that everyone's got when they come into a non-towered aerodrome be it an RPT aircraft like Qantas Link or Virgin uh, right through the private operators uh, so hopefully you can put all that together and, and have a good discussion today about how to how to manage in-flight separation in non-towered aerodromes. I guess from Qantas Link's perspective, we recognised that earlier this this year, that as the COVID pandemic was hopefully um, starting to, to get a bit better, that we were going to see more flying in non-towered aerodromes. And, and we are seeing that, which is great. You're flying a lot more, we're flying a lot more, so hopefully it stays that way. Um, but I guess the, the downside to that is the ramp up in flying, it's actually increased the likelihood of airborne conflict at non-towered aerodromes. Uh, at Qantas Link, we, we want to work with the industry to try and I guess, uh, identify any any risks at particular aerodromes or any challenges and just overall reduce the risk of airborne conflict. And um, thank you again to, to CASA for having us not only at this seminar today, but they've also um, had us at a number of AB safety seminars over the last few months at, at various regional airports. So thank you for that. And again, thank you to, to everyone that, that dialed in today. Last I checked, there was about 150 people online. So thanks for taking the time. Uh, to, at, for this session today, it's basically going to be three main parts. Um, I really want to help you understand uh, Qantas Link operations, and, and I guess that might give you an understanding of RPT operations into CTAFs in general. So I'm going to talk a bit about uh, a typical Dash 8 arrival, includes, including the benefit of why we do runway aligned approaches. Uh, I want to talk about previous conflict events that we've had at non-towered aerodromes, 
And I also want to talk about how we're teaching our pilots to separate from other aircraft. A pretty good starting place is to talk about the two main types of dash eight that we do have. Uh, the, the main fleet type we've got is the dash eight 400, otherwise known as the Q400. That's our slightly bigger dash eight. Uh, seats about 74 people and weighs just under 29 tonnes. And uh, I'll talk shortly why that weight is important. It cruises at about 350 knots indicated, but what's probably more appropriate for, for most people listening today is our speeds below 10,000 feet. Uh, so typically we'll be operating at 235 knots below 10,000 feet, and we've got a final approach speed of around about 130 knots. So compared to a lot of light aircraft, on final we could be doing uh, double the speed, and in the cruise as well, probably approaching an aerodrome at double the speed of, of most light aircraft. Um, the Dash 8 Q400, it's, it's got slightly bigger engines than our other Dash 8, so it can climb a lot uh, more efficiently. And um, if you hear a Dash 8 Q400 on the radio, they're, they're the ones that use the Delta call sign at the end. So Q-Link 164 Delta, for example. Uh, so I mentioned the takeoff weight and why that's important for this type of Q400. Um, I guess when we do land at an aerodrome, um, a lot of taxiways have certain weight limitations. So you might be operating where the Q400s is operating and think, why don't they take a particular taxiway? Why is it always getting in my way? Or why do they have to backtrack all the way to the runway before they can turn? Uh, quite often that's due to the weight of the aircraft and local aerodrome, I guess, restrictions. And probably one last little consideration is the, the Q400 fits within the medium weight turbulence category. Um, so just throw that out there, just, just as a little bit of a precaution, um, it may be a good idea to just delay your departure a little bit, not take off immediately after the Q400 if you're in quite a light aircraft. And same thing when you do a circuit, probably don't just cut in straight behind the Q400. The other dash eight that we operate, um, and I should say the Q400, the one previously I mentioned, mostly gets operated around Queensland and into New South Wales, whereas the dash eight 300, which is our 50 seater, um, typically is operated in South Australia, Tasmania and Victoria, as well as parts of New South Wales. A little bit lighter, uh, goes slightly slower, but below 10,000 feet, we've got very similar speeds to the Q400. So again, doing about double the speed of a typical light aircraft and around about 115 knots on final approach. Are these slightly slower, um, lower performance dash eights? They don't use the Delta call sign at the end. So for instance, it'll, it'll just be Q-Link 164. So there are two main dash eights in a nutshell. Um, I guess there's two main ways that we will arrive at a non-towed aerodrome. One may be a, a visual approach in a circuit, and the other one may be an instrument approach. So talking about circuits, first of all, I guess the, the key thing is the, the dash eight um, will fly a lot faster, has a lot more inertia, and um, because of all that, it'll fly quite a wider and higher circuit than, than what you might normally do. So we'll join downwind at 1,500 feet above aerodrome level. And when we're on downwind, probably be somewhere between about 160 and 190 knots, depending on the type of dash eight. Uh, the downwind spacing will be about two and a half miles from, from the runway, so a little bit wider than your normal light aircraft. And again, that's just to help manage the speed and inertia as they turn on the base and final. Uh, just a bit of a side note, typically once we pass the, the landing threshold, we'll extend downwind by about 40 seconds before we turn base. And then that positions us on about a, a two to three mile final, depending on wind and how the pilot's gone. So we're normally intercepting final somewhere between 600 and 900 feet. So that's our circuit in a nutshell and, and why we, we end up flying a little bit of a wider and bigger circuit than, than many others, uh, many other light aircraft. The more common way that we will approach an aerodrome is via an instrument approach. And I'll talk about why we use instrument approaches shortly, um, but, just as an example, so we will normally fly what's called an RMP or an RNAV approach. And here's an example from, from the JEPS here, and you don't have to, to get too stuck into that. There's a lot of detail there. But for those that haven't um, looked at an RNAV approach or RMP approach before, basically there's just a series of GPS waypoints like this one here, which is Wagga, Whiskey, Charlie. We just fly over those GPS waypoints at a certain altitude, and then that positions us nicely on a straight in runway aligned three degree profile to land. So really, really nice, easy way for um, aircraft to, to arrive at an aerodrome. Uh, typically we'll, we'll start at an instrument approach 5,000 feet above aerodrome level, and we'll be about no, no faster than about 210 knots past that initial approach fix. Uh, the aircraft will slow and it'll be below 160 knots on, on final there. So all up, it, it takes about five to six minutes for, for a dash eight to, to do an instrument approach like this. 
Uh, how that looks, if we overlay, I guess, this instrument approach into Wagga runway 05 and compare it to an arrival from the north, um, basically it just takes us out and positions us on a nice long 10 mile final to, to land at the runway. So why do we fly mostly instrument approaches? And as Ben will talk about shortly, very, very common for, for Virgin to do the same as do most RPT operators. There, there's a number of benefits. And I guess the key one is runway aligned instrument approaches have been shown to be safer and result in more stable approaches when compared to a visual approach or a circuit. And there's a number of benefits for us as RPT aircraft to doing this instrument approach. I guess the primary one is that it allows us to, to get down underneath the clouds. Um, it gives us the ability to descend below lower safe altitudes and um, be able to position ourselves visually to, to land at the airfield. But there's a number of other benefits that include, it gives us a more consistent flight path. Um, that allows us to manage our airspeed and inertia much more safely. It's much easier for the pilots to fly with automation and that's not because we're lazy, it's because it actually then allows us to focus on other things. Um, gives us better information processing ability, improves our situation awareness, and just allows us to perceive other potential threats or errors in our operating environment. The good thing too is it gives us a predictable flight path, um, as we saw on the previous slide, puts us on a nice 10 mile final in most cases, and that makes it actually easier for other aircraft to know where we are and where we're coming from. Uh, as I'll explain a little bit more shortly, it's actually, it can give us safer separation from circuit traffic and also training areas. So we don't end up flying low into the circuit. We can give it all a wide berth and uh, allow us, us to separate ourselves nicely from any aircraft in the circuit. And the other benefit too is the straight in runway aligned approach gives us better flight deck visibility of circuit traffic. And this is what I mean. This photo here is actually taken from the jump seat, so it's um, a slightly better view than, than what the pilots have. You can see the pilots, the captain's eyes actually a bit lower. But within a typical um, airliner flight deck, and I think Ben still puts his photo up later, it's actually worse than a 737. Um, we've got quite a large glare shield, uh, overhead panels, and also if you, you don't have wide wrapped around windows either. So it's very difficult for us to see any aircraft that are, I guess, below this glare shield. Um, once they go beyond 90 degrees out to our left or right, as well, it's very hard for us to see any aircraft above us. So very difficult to pick up other traffic if we do join the circuit. Whereas if we do the runway aligned approach, and this is in the port quarry, it allows us to really easily see any other aircraft that are on downwind or base. So there's, they're the benefits in a nutshell about why we like to do runway aligned approaches and you, you don't see us as commonly join the circuit, but what we're starting to see um, with this ramp up of flying is increased occurrences, particularly at your larger training airfields like Wagga and even Mildura, where we're having pilots that are conducting circuits, um, unfortunately just turn base in front of the dash aid. And, and sometimes that's ended up meaning things have gotten a bit too close. And as resulted, even in the last few weeks, a, a, a number of go arounds from the dash aid crew just to make sure they're separated from the aircraft in front. I guess what we're trying to get across is, yeah, we can do a visual circuit, but it's actually almost impossible for the Dash 8 to fly a circuit to land if there's multiple aircraft in a circuit. And as we saw right at the start, we're, we're basically doing double the speed of anyone else in the circuit, together with the um, the wider circuit and the difficulty spotting other aircraft because of, I guess, flight modern flight deck design. That's why it's quite a challenge to do a circuit with multiple training aircraft as well. So I guess what we're trying to get across is despite circuit traffic, I guess, legally having right away to anyone else doing the straight approach, what we're just suggesting is maybe we can all just work together to, to make the arrival sequence work. Um, so we're not saying that, hey, always give way to us or anything like that. Um, totally respect the, the rules and everything like that. But I guess we can work together. And the first point there is let's let's develop a plan. So if you're in the circuit and we're joining the, the final approach, um, probably a good idea for both sets of crew, crew just to confirm the intentions of the other aircraft and just determine nice and early who's going to be number one. And it doesn't always have to be the Dash 8 that, that goes number one. Um, you might actually, it might be easier for, for everyone if you turn base nice and early or in normal spacing and, and go number one. Don't feel like you have to get out of our way. But again, it's all about communication and developing that plan. Uh, the second consideration, and this is only if it's safe for you to do so, is just consider adjusting your circuit profile if you've got an RPT or another aircraft to, on, a, on a long final on instrument approach. Is it appropriate for you to, to possibly do something like extend downwind or an orbit or something like that? 
But again, that's that's only if it's safe. You know, that might not be appropriate in, in sort of poorer weather or if there's other aircraft behind you, that sort of thing. And another consideration is, you know, can you actually reduce speed and, and configure a little bit earlier to, to give yourself that separation from the other aircraft that's going to be number one? And we can do that too. Like if we know that we're going to go number two to an aircraft in the circuit, um, we'll take out our final stages of flaps and slow down nice and early. But you can see all that really relies on that first step, developing a plan and communicating your intentions with the other aircraft. So early this year um, at Qantas Link, we, we did a review into uh, incidents where there was a, re a reduction in separation between one of our aircraft and um, someone else at a non-towered aerodrome. And it really identified three main reasons why breakdown in separation can occur. And this can really apply to anyone, not, not just us. So one of the, the main reasons was the first point there, a clear separation plan wasn't determined by the flight crew. So they knew another aircraft was out there. They just assumed it would be okay though, and they didn't work out a plan to make sure that they were separated from that aircraft. The second common cause was, yep, yeah, they established the initial communication with the other aircraft. They worked out a plan, who was gonna be number one or who was gonna be number two, but there was no follow-up to that plan to see that it was still appropriate. So, you know, 10 minutes out from the aerodrome, um, for instance, you know, we with one of our aircraft might think they were going to be number one, but there was then no update as they got closer just to double check the other aircraft's position. And in some instances, the other aircraft actually ended up getting a little bit faster than anticipated and we saw a conflict occur. So the second point is there, just keep reviewing to make sure that that plan is still appropriate. And the last um, common reason that we have there is the other aircraft was either not known to our crew, so they either didn't communicate uh, on the CTAF, maybe they were on the wrong CTAF, or a plan was established but the air, other aircraft didn't follow the communicated intentions. So they, they all contributed to reduced separation incidents, including something called a TCAS RA. So TCAS, maybe not everyone on, on the dial in today has, has heard this, but a TCAS or Traffic Collision Avoidance System, it was introduced um, into the aviation industry in the 1980s, and it's, it's a system that's fitted in airliner aircraft, um, and all the Dash 8s have them as well. But basically what it uses is transponder returns to provide pilots with, advo with advisory and, advo uh, and avoidance information and instructions. So what the TCAS does is, is based on your transponder returns of our aircraft as well as the other aircraft, um, it works out, well, if the two aircraft were to cross paths, what would be their CPA or the closest point of approach? And to be a little bit morbid, if a collision was to exist in the air, where would that a collision occur? So based on the calculations of this CPA, the TCAS will work out whether that threat sorry, whether that collision risk exists and we'll give the pilots either something called a TA, which is a traffic advisory, or an RA, which, which is a resolution advisory. So TCAS is a great system, but as we're teaching our pilots, it's really the last line of defence to providing a mid-air collision. It's a bit like GPWS, if you've ever heard about that, to, to avoid terrain, the old pull-up terrain um, you might have seen in shows or air crash investigations. That's your last line of defence before, I guess, colliding with terrain. TCAS is our last line of defence before colliding with an aircraft. So the way TCAS works, just very quickly, is it, it effectively calculates bubbles around the aircraft. So let's let's talk about the yellow bubble first. If it's worked out that another aircraft is going to, um, I guess, fly within that that yellow bubble, it means that we're somewhere between twenty and forty eight seconds from a collision. So it's actually not a lot, but the TCAS system will generate, generate the TA, the traffic advisory. And at that stage, we don't have to maneuver, we just have to look for that aircraft. The more critical step is the next one. If the other aircraft go, gets within this red bubble, so now we're only possibly as little as 15 seconds away from a collision. So it's a bit more serious and that's where we'll get our um, instructions to, to climb or descend. And it's a requirement that, that the crew follow those instructions. How TCAS looks in the Dash 8s, and it's, I guess it's similar across um, most aircraft. If I just, if we look across to the right here to start with, this is how it looks in the Q100. Um, it'll give us information about where other aircraft are in front of us. And if that's, um, if we get the TA traffic advisory, it'll go yellow. If we get the resolution advisory where we have to maneuver, it'll go red. But apart from that, it just gives us the information about where other aircraft are. Um, 
This one over here is from the older Dash 8s, which is very similar to systems on, on other turboprops, um, and it shows where other aircraft are. So as you can see, um, it's actually not that accurate in that it's, it's very hard to determine exactly where you are laterally. With respect to us, we get a rough idea of distance, but it's it's very hard to separate um, using TCAS align, it, and that's why it's a requirement that our crew don't separate based on TCAS returns only. It requires a bit more than that. So I guess what we're seeing is it's it's effective radio communication that is vital to help managing traffic separation at non-towered aerodromes. And we're encouraging all pilots not just to use their radio to broadcast their position, but to use as a tool to, to understand and probe other aircraft's intentions. And, and that's going to help you develop a separation plan. So I know nice and early when I was learning to fly and, and early in my aviation career, I sort of thought, oh yeah, I just make a broadcast at, at my position and it's all good. But no, we'd like it, that next step as pilots is using the radio as a tool to, I guess, understand what other aircraft are out there, any sort of threats that exist and then use the radio as a tool to, to manage any potential threats. Uh, other things that we're teaching our pilots, and, and I'd consider for all people on the line here, it's, it's important that any sort of broadcast you make, avoid terminology or locations that other pilots won't understand. So for instance, we're, we're teaching the pilots at Qantas Link to avoid saying IFR waypoints, because um, I don't know about you, but before I got into uh, an IFR aircraft, I had no idea where I don't know, Wagga Sierra Alpha was. That, that meant nothing to me. However, if you can use something like a compass quadrant with a, a distance and um, I guess uh, that bearing, so to speak, that, that's a much more easier to, to determine position. So five miles to the southeast is much easier than an IFR um, waypoint. And likewise, our crew don't know all the local waypoints or something that might be on a, uh, on a VTC. We, we don't have VTCs, we don't know all the VFR waypoints. So again, if there's a, a local feature that you use to separate, we might not understand that, which is why the old, um, I guess, compass quadrant distance might be the most effective way to describe your position. Now for managing uh, traffic separation at, at Qantas Link, unless um, we have the other aircraft visually sighted or we've worked out some other sort of horizontal, sorry, horizontal separation, um, we actually require our crew to maintain a thousand feet as a minimum vertical separation from other traffic. Now that may sound like a lot in your world, in our world, that's, that's actually not, not a lot because when you consider rates of descent, rates of climb, that sort of thing, um, a thousand feet gives us that nice buffer from other aircraft. So you might hear our crew contact you on the CTAF to, to come up with a separation plan. And with the separation plans, you know, we don't want any of our pilots to be air traffic controllers. It's just coming up with, you know, is this, if we suggest something, is that suitable for you? And you need to speak, just let us know if it's not. If our crew asks you to maintain, is a particular altitude um, appropriate for you? And you think it's going to end up um, getting you a bit too close to terrain or cloud or something like that, speak up, come up with a new plan. But I, the main thing is that it's not just us, but all, all crew members, if we work together on the radio to come up with some sort of separation plan, I think that's in everyone's interests. So the following are a couple of examples of arranged separation. Uh, so this first one here, it's, um, let's say you're in Alpha Bravo Charlie. So on the CTAF, you broadcast Port Macquarie traffic, Alpha Bravo Charlie departing to the south, climbing to 6,500. One of our Dash 8 crew might hear that, they're inbound from Sydney, so they're inbound from the south. They think, oh, OK, now there's a potential traffic conflict. How can I arrange some sort of separation? So they might broadcast back to you and say, Alpha Bravo Charlie, Q-Link $162. We're passing 9,000 feet on descent. Are you able to maintain 4,000 feet until we pass? We'll stop our descent at 5,000 feet. You can see we're not trying to be air traffic controllers or direct around the sky, but it's just trying to come up with some sort of plan to give us that thousand feet separation until we both work out that we're clear of each other. Obviously, if that altitude wasn't going to work, speak up, come up with a new plan. Happy to hear from you. And another example is, is this one here. Like, let's say you lined up runway 21 to the parts of the south again, um, you need to broadcast Port Macquarie traffic, Alpha Bravo Charlie, lining up runway 21. Um, the dash eight again might be to the south in a diff different sort of scenario, and we, we get back to you. Alpha Bravo Charlie, Q Link 164 Delta. We're five miles to the south, passing 2,000 feet. Request you delay your takeoff roll until we join downwind. 
So again, just nice positive separation assurance uh, without anyone trying to be a, a pseudo trader controller. Uh, other strategies we're teaching the, the pilots at Qantas Link is, is just seek clarification from other aircraft about their position and intentions and don't make any assumptions. And I think that's really just a takeaway that anyone in the industry can apply, not just our pilots. And we're also really encouraging our pilots to take a conservative approach and delay the arrival or the takeoff if there's any doubt about, uh, I guess, separation from another aircraft. We'd much rather see our crew conduct a go around and come back around via another approach than get close to another aircraft. And just some final considerations before I wrap up today. Um, one of the main things we're, we've seen a little bit of this lately is um, aircraft just not speaking up on the radio. So we, we see them on the transponder and we can see they're quite close to circuit, but they're not making any radio calls. Please, please, please just speak up if you are in the vicinity of an aerodrome. Um, it's just good to know what your intentions are and whether, I guess, your arrival departure could, co could conflict with ours. And likewise, speak up if you're not sure about what our intentions or location are. We'd love to, love to hear from you. Don't ever hesitate to, to call um, one of our pilots on the radio and ask them what they're doing, even if you have to use plain language. Uh, the second point down the bottom there is please switch on your transponder and, and select out. Um, we, we can't get the, the TCAS returns unless you um, do have your transponder on. And just as a, as a side note, um, we, we can't get ADSB um, returns from your aircraft. So if you don't have a, trans, a transponder, but you only have uh, ADSB out, we don't have ADSB in. We've only got ADSB out ourselves. So we can't pick up other ADSB signals. Only when there's a transponder, I believe they're called mode C squibs. And then the last point is um, consider closing speeds with opposite direction traffic. So I gave the example just before this slide about the aircraft departing to the south. Um, of Port Macquarie, just consider, I guess, closing speeds. You know, the other you might hear the dash eight still ten miles out to the south or something like that, and think you've got heaps of room, heaps of time for your departure. But consider if you're going to be doing about 120 knots, and the dash eight's doing about 180 knots. If we combine those speeds, we've got a closing speed of about 300 knots, and it's going to be even uh, even faster if you throw in some jet aircraft like the version 737s. But based on a, a 300 knot closing speed, that means I guess both aircraft are flying towards each other at five miles per minute. So I guess going back to the example I gave, if the other aircraft is 10 miles inbound, that means at a five mile per minute closing speed, you're only about two minutes away from potentially colliding with each other. So that's that's something I didn't consider early on in, in my career, but really think about closing speeds with arriving in the party aircraft. Uh, that's me in a nutshell. Um, I think Mike will open up to some questions shortly. Thanks to, to everyone listening, but uh, we'd love to, to hear your feedback. If there's um, something that the Dash 8 crew could be doing a little bit better at your aerodrome, um, we, we'd love to hear your feedback. We can always pass that on. And there's our email address as well to, to take any of that feedback. And likewise, if you've had uh, any questions from this presentation that, that I haven't covered, please just email us and, and we can answer those. So I'll leave that up there for a second, but um, yeah, over to you, Michael, if there's any questions. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Um, yeah, great uh, presentation, mate, thanks. One uh, that seems to be relevant uh, uh, that um, people would get some benefit from is a question from Mark Rottenstein. He was asking, uh, in terms of Qantas Link, I guess, um, do you make standard, what, or what standard calls do you make, uh, you know, arriving and departing out of, a, out of an uncontrolled aerodrome? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So um, with arriving into a, a non-controlled aerodrome, typically our, our pilots will broadcast at 30 miles, and that's usually when we're up at about 10,000 feet. So 30 miles might seem like uh, a pretty, pretty far distance compared to a lot of light aircraft where they'll typically broadcast at about 10 miles. But if you consider the inbound speeds, we're only probably about five or six minutes away from hitting the circuit at that point. So that, that's why we'll make that little bit of an early um, broadcast and, and just hear if there's anyone out there and also gives us time to develop, I guess, a, a separation plan. Uh, typically, if there are other aircraft around, we encourage our crew to again broadcast around the 10, 15 mile mark and when they are commencing an instrument approach. And then apart from that, it's just all your normal sort of AIP or um, CASA advisory circular recommended uh, radio calls. So joining the circuit, departing the circuit, entering, vacating runways, that sort of thing. Thanks, Hopefully Andrew. that answers and, the question. 
Yeah, thanks, mate. Uh, great. Uh, just one more, I think, to you before we move um, on to Ben and um, Virgin's presentation. Um, and I think you might have mentioned this through the um, through your presentation. But where do you see uh, the majority of incidents that uh, you know your crews might have um, going into and out of it? Uh, of an uncontrolled aerodrome. Sort of what particular parts of the circuit or are there times of the day when you, you know, particularly have issues? Yeah, yeah, I guess so times of the day, um, it's it's typically daylight hours when when people are flying quite a lot. So um, I don't know if there's a particular time of the day, but I guess it's the, the bigger issues that we have, it, it's more to do if there's aircraft um, in the circuit and I guess our high speed or our runway alignment, uh, runway aligned approaches might create a little bit of a conflict. That's where we've seen it. And most recently, yeah, places like um, Mildura and Wagga, we fly into there a fair bit and they've also got some really busy flying schools together with quite um, quite a robust GA scene as well. And I guess it's it's times where there's that high density of traffic, just our crew trying to fit in. That's that's where we've seen it. Um, so I guess it all, all comes back to that plan where, sorry, what we were talking about earlier, where it's about communicating with each other, trying to understand each other intention, each other's intentions and just coming up with a plan. And then I guess if we can go from there, it, it doesn't really matter where we arrive from. Um, we can all organise that traffic separation. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. That's um, fantastic. Um, yeah, it just goes to show how important broadcasting is for um, the alerted sea and avoid procedure and coming up with a plan of action to um, deconflict ourselves around um, a busy terminal area, for example. So thank you um, so much, Andrew. Um, I think what we'll do now uh, is to move on to um, Ben Van Dongen and uh, the Virgin presentation. So um, introducing Ben, um, and uh, the presentation from Virgin. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, g'day everybody. Can everyone hear me there? I should be able to, can you see that presentation now? Hopefully it's on the yep. screen. Yep. All good, loud, loud and clear and got your presentation. Excellent. So uh, again, I'd like to say welcome um, this afternoon and thanks very much for CASA having us along. It's a great presentation by Andrew. It ties in uh, fairly nicely with certainly the Virgin Australia operation and um, how we operate in and out of non-controlled aerodromes as well. Joining me on the call, as uh, Michael mentioned earlier, is Scott Mitchell. He's our air traffic control and meteorology or air traffic and meteorology manager as well. Um, if you'd like to say hello, Scott. Hi, everyone, and uh, thanks for uh, having me along today. I'll be able to uh, help Ben out with any questions that he can't answer. So, <laughs> so just by way of background, um, Myself, uh, I'm the 737 Fleet Training Manager at Virgin, and I've been flying the 73 for almost 20 years now, um, domestically in South Pacific operations as well. Um, my GA background, I've still got a current grade two instructor rating. Uh, I volunteered for a significant number of years with the Australian Air Force cadets while I was operating with Virgin as well as a um, as a flight instructor out at RAF Base Ambly. Uh, so I still do have that connection with GA. So I understand the importance of operations and not controlled aer aerodromes, not just from our perspective, but also as um, a GA pilot, knowing the importance of these with regard to seeing the void and some of the procedures in and out of some of these airports. So I'd like to sort of kick off, I suppose. Sorry if I turn my head to the left. It's just because I've got a secondary screen set up here. Uh, similar to what Andrew said, you know, we see... Uh, non-controlled aerodrome risks, I suppose, from our perspective, is obviously a mix of aircraft performance coming into these ports, seeing avoid limitations associated with our operation and communication. Now, our exposure to non-controlled aerodromes at Virgin is, is, I would say, significantly lower than what you see at Q-Link. In the east coast of Australia, the predominant operation that we have is with Ballina, which now has the SFIS, and um, also ports such as Prospine, Hamilton Island up there and also we do end up uh, if we're off schedule coming in and out of uh, other ports on the east coast where the tower controller might have gone home so rocky Mackay, down into Lawney, uh, occasionally down there over in wa we do see uh, an increased exposure to non-controlled aerodromes with a lot of the resource ports but obviously the traffic footprint going in and out of those ports tends to be a little bit different because there it does tend to be a, a significant increase in high capacity rpt operations to those ports just by nature of the fact that they are generally resource uh, strips in and out of there one of the points that andrew raised 
um, just earlier, I'd just like to highlight it on this slide and I'll come back to it a bit later on, is the limitations we've seen avoid. That photo, as you can see from the flight deck there, was taken from the jump seat again, and that was just into Port Vila. So as Andrew mentioned with the Dash 8, we don't get a huge amount of visibility as much as it is a very nice window seat most of the time. Um, it, the forward visibility and even uh, side visibility isn't that great, and it's probably not what a lot of you, you may have expected coming out of these aeroplanes. So I'll talk about those a little bit later on. So to give you a little bit, a bit of background as to how the 7.3 performs in on a normal descent profile, as I said, a lot of our descents are done inside controlled airspace, but the profile and uh, performance doesn't change for us very much, whether we're going to Ballina or not. So to give you a bit of an idea, um, we're sitting at about 30 miles, 250 knots indicated, so tazzing higher than that, at approximately 10,000 feet. As we approach the aerodrome, We'll still be doing generally about 20, um, 250 knots at about 5,000 feet with about 20 track miles to run. And that's when, and when I say track miles, so if we're tracking via an instrument approach, obviously, um, that's going to add a few extra miles compared to tracking direct to the field for a visual circuit or something like that. We start decelerating generally at about that 20 mile point. So that's where we'll start slowing back down to our clean speed, our flaps up speed, which is generally sitting around the 200 to 210 knot point before we start configuring for the approach. At 10 miles, we're generally somewhere between 180 uh, knots and at 3000 feet. That's a standard three times profile for us. So you won't get us varying too much at that 10 mile point. It's, it's a bit like a funnel. The closer we get, the tighter we stick to those um, speeds and the heights. Bit of rule of thumb for you. So when, you, when you're out flying in a non-controlled aerodrome, you do hear a Virgin airplane coming in to give you a bit of an idea how we manage our energy coming in. Most of the time, our profile runs at about a three times altitude. So we work on a three times profile. So five times three is about 15 nautical miles. And then for a deceleration, we work in level flight. We work on about 10 knots per nautical mile. So if you look at the two at the 20 nautical mile example, you can see 250 knots. So if I'm at 5,000 feet times by three, that gives me 15 nautical miles. I need to lose from 250 knots back to 200 knots. I add another five. And that's where I come up with that 20 nautical mile point. So, you know, 20 miles out might seem a fair way, as Andrew mentioned earlier, but at that point, we're still probably doing a, somewhere in the vicinity of at least four and a half nautical miles a minute. So we're not very far away from the circuit at all, or certainly being in the vicinity of the aerodrome, uh, we'll be within that 10 mile point in the next two, certainly in the next couple of minutes at that point. And so that's why, again, you'll hear about, um, our aircraft calling early at that 30 mile and 15 mile point, just to make sure that they're aware of uh, the traffic that's, or well, they're painting their, the crew are painting a picture for themselves as to any potential conflicts early on. And as we said, 30 miles might seem a long way, but we're not very far time-wise away. It's only five to six minutes before we become a problem. So when we look at how we operate in some of these ports, I've just got a, um, a instrument approach chart for VOR runway 29 and Proserpine there. We still have to comply with all class Charlie speed limitations in Australia because a lot of the time we only drop out of the controlled airspace point at the bottom of the C zone. So when you're looking at somewhere like Proserpine, that's actually quite low. Uh, if you're looking at Ballina, it's a little bit higher and certainly over in WA, that class C and E corridors are a, a bit higher again. But certainly below 10,000 feet, we're compliant with the Class C speed limits and also the circuit speed limits as per the AIP for um, the Class G uh, as well. So and the circuit speed limits for that uh, for those operations as well. On top of that, we generally would be looking at an instrument approach. And now most of the time we like our crews, we do encourage our crew to fly visual circuits where they feel comfortable to. But as for the um, reasons Andrew mentioned earlier, uh, stabilised approach and flight deck management or flight deck workload management. We, we also do have a tendency to fly instrument approaches to stabilise ourselves a lot earlier. So when we do fly those approaches, as you can see on this chart, you can see in the note, we're a Cat C aeroplane. So we would be limited to 210 knots over the top of the VOR for that approach. If you think about the track miles on that particular approach there, 
uh, as we go over the top of the VOR at 210 knots, we've actually still got a long way to travel yet because we're going to go out for two and a half minutes and back in. So we could feasibly looking at still about 25, 26 miles to run as we cross over the top of the VOR on that approach. So we might still be a little way away, even though we're in, um, on over the top of the air, aerodrome. Last but not least, we also do have a company speed limitation of 210 knots indicated when we're below 3,000 feet. Now, as I mentioned earlier, normally we'd be back at about 180 to 200, but um, we do have a limitation for crew to comply with, irrespective of airspace that they're operating in, they will be back at 210 below 3,000. Now, again, that's indicated. So out of 10 miles, we might be, our true airspeed might be up around 220, 230. So we're still, we're still sort of moving along there at about three and a half, sometimes four miles a minute, even though we're still 10 nautical miles out as we're getting ready for the approach. So communications, uh, for those interested, that's a photo of uh, in our simulator on the approach into Queenstown. Um, the communications coming into a non-control air, um, aerodrome. As Andrew mentioned, the crew have to comply with the standard calls as per the AIP. So our crew are encouraged to speak up to try and resolve any traffic conflicts that they have early. And there's a number of reasons for that. Um, a, the speed, as I said, at 30 miles, we're not that far away from the actual airport. But B, we've got two of us in the flight deck and generally speaking, to change our plans at the last minute is that it actually imposes quite a significant workload uh, in the flight deck itself. So anytime we're increasing workload in the flight deck, it reduces our capacity to look out and it also reduces our capacity to uh, keep an ear out as well. And uh, that it overall can reduce situational awareness. So we do get try to get in early so we can work out if we do have any conflicts with any traffic that's already operating in the area and we'll try and resolve that as early as possible, just so that the crew can have the maximum amount of SA available. With regards to the area broadcast, and uh, we, you know, we do talk about vicinity of non-controlled aerodromes. While we're operating in Class Charlie airspace a lot of the time, we do have a requirement to for the crew to broadcast on an area frequency at least two minutes before they enter Class Golf airspace. So places like Ballina and things like that, that might occur quite high up, uh, obviously at Proserpine, that's going to occur a lot lower down with the Class Charlie base that's actually there. And last but not least, the, we have a, a requirement and it is written in our policy that the CTAF frequency will be monitored by both pilots. So at no time will you ever have an individual being the only person responsible for listening out and the separation uh, or de-conflicting with other traffic that uh, is in the area. Both pilots are required to listen on the CTAF. Both pilots are, to, are required to verify the location of what they believe might be conflicting traffic and to come up with a uh, separation plan for that traffic. As I said, additional calls for us 30 and we've actually got another one at 15 miles as well, just to make sure everyone's aware. And we do have a uh, policy, as Andrew mentioned, it's similar at Q-Link. We tell our crews to make sure they use the quadrant distance rather than instrument approach procedure terminology. And I'll talk about that a little bit um, further in a second as to why that's even more critically important given some of the instrument approaches that the 7.3 can actually um, carry out. And again, with the regards the um, quadrant distance, even though we may not be tracking direct to the airport, we do have the capability to put a um, a distance measurement into the FMC and we can derive a distance directly from pretty much any waypoint we want around the airport to be able to give that quadrant and distance to make sure that everyone's on the same page and for the people who are operating in the vicinity they can talk back to us as well and give us their position without being concerned about or confused about where we're going. So there's a couple of hands up if you're happy we'll just hold till the end for that one. So approach selection um, when we look at, here's an example of the RMP Yankee runway 14, which is an AR. It's an authorization required instrument approach for us. Uh, so we have to have CASA approval in order to conduct these, and the aircraft must be suitably equipped and the crew trained. When you look at this particular approach, if you can imagine that I decided to come into Hamilton Island and you're 
flying around out near uh, Whitehaven coming back towards Hamo and having a lovely holiday. Uh, if one of our crew suddenly said that they decided they were tracking to Hamilton Island 843, that's not very relevant information for most crew or for most pilots because of the fact that these charts, while they are in DAP, again, a VFR pilot, we don't expect to have to have, to have access to this sort of information. So if we were traveling to 843, we're actually only going to be down at 3,500 feet, which isn't um, that high on that approach as we circle around there. So if we've got conflicting traffic to the north, we may very well uh, encounter them as we come around on the approach onto 1-4. The other issue is because of the fact that we don't this these particular instrument approaches aren't necessarily conducting straight in maneuvers from the outset we're not establishing at 10 15 miles because they do have the curves we can become established within that right on the five mile point or well, sometimes a little bit closer in um, to final whilst conducting that instrument approach so the the more plain language that our crews use the easier it is for everyone to understand what our intent is and also where we are and how we can deconflict if there's an issue. With regards straight in visual circuits, we, we do uh, conduct straight in visual approaches again. We do place a restriction on crew for any visual circuit uh, that they were required to have a 1500 foot cloud base. Now 1500 foot circuit is standard for us similar to the Dash 8 and we require our crews to have eight kilometres, minimum eight kilometres visibility. Might seem like a lot, pretty much VFR alternate minima. Uh, however, when again, when you consider that we're doing three miles a minute on just on downwind, and it's a fairly busy time as we're configuring running checklists, um, I think that we uh, that we end up having to increase these minimas just to make sure that uh, we can make we stay visual the whole way around without having any major issues and also that we can spot traffic if we're not aware of it. As I said, RMPARs can contain curves, which makes it harder to deconflict. And as Andrew has alluded to, stabilised approach is a very, very, very important um, element of our uh, approach criteria. And the earlier that we can set ourselves up and reduce our workload with a, say, a coded instrument approach or anything like that, the, the higher the stabilised rate of approach becomes, or the higher the chance the approach remaining stabilised becomes. So you will see Virgin Aircraft, particularly non-controlled aerodromes, probably tend to do a instrument approach more often than they you'll see them fly a visual circuit and a lot of it's just for that workload management so that they're flying a nice stable approach the approach is generally coded into the fmc and the automation can be left engaged that gives them the time and space to look outside and also keep an ear out on the radio to make sure that any traffic that's communicating with them can be properly understood as to with their location and to improve sa for everyone so see and avoid, we require our pilots, uh, pilot flying in particular, the pilot monitoring's sometimes got their heads down, switching radios and doing checklists and configuring and things like that. So the pilot flying we mandate must be on the lookout minimum 50% of the time, coming into a non-controlled aerodrome or any time they're operating in the vicinity of one. And we do encourage the crew to use, maximise use of landing lights. Now, depending on which model of 7.3 we've got, we can have anywhere up to four main landing lights so we've got two sets of fix uh, two fixed and two retractables the newer ones tend to have just a set of led bright bright leds in the uh, wing route so you will generally spot us even by uh day but certainly if we're in any operating in a non-controlled aerodrome at night we're pretty well lit up normally and as andrew mentioned we do we are fitted with tcas similar function well same functionality similar symbology on our screens uh, but again, TCAS is a tool and not the primary method used for separation. I'll give you a really good, good example of that. I myself have been coming into Ballina um, from the west. We got deviated over to over the topic uh, casino to come in. Now we were uh, not quite in the vicinity of Ballina. We were closer to Lismore and up fairly high still coming in. But we actually had traffic tracking from Ballina across underneath us that we weren't aware of on the CTAF, on the Northern River CTAF. 
because of the, um, they weren't transmitting and we don't know, I don't know where they ended up, but I know that we had to stop descent and we maintained a thousand foot separation on that aircraft. And the only reason we did identify them was with TCAS initially. I never saw them even when they went a thousand feet underneath us. So again, that communication is critically important um, because the TCAS really is that last line of defense. It's not the primary method of separation for us. That's about all. And again, mine's a little bit shorter because we just simply, we tend not to have the same exposure as Q-Link does to uh, operations at non-controlled aerodromes at Virgin. But it's certainly one of those elements that where we do see um, not an increase in safety events, but there is a lot more nervousness, I suppose, operating in and out of non-controlled aerodromes. And so we do encourage our crew to speak up. And I would also say the same for anyone on this call. If you're in the vicinity, and you hear one of our aircraft coming in as you would with a Q-Link, please feel free to speak up, speak in plain language. We've all been sitting in a um, light aircraft at some point in our career, so we do understand that not everyone's going to get the radio word perfect, but plain English communication can solve a lot of issues early on for everyone in the area. That's about it from me. Handing over to Michael. Uh, thanks, Ben, um, for that uh, great presentation. I think we have, we have two hands up um yep. what we might do is um unmute at the end of the presentations and we'll take the questions verbally i think when the uh, presentations are finished if i could just ask those people to be patient we'll get to you with um with the questions uh in the q a after the uh, presentations have concluded uh, but i don't have any specific um questions uh ben for you for uh, uh, as a result of your presentation. Thank you so much for that. Um, another, no at all. Another great uh, presentation from uh, our scheduled uh, air transport uh, operators. So I think what we'll do is we'll move on now to Jill Bailey from RAO's uh, Recreational Aviation Australia for uh, her presentation on RAO's operations. Um, and, um, and then we'll hear from Cody, uh, who's the um, uh, Manager of Safety of RAOs, and Cody will give us this particular uh, presentation on RAO safety. So uh, over to you. Uh, thank you, Jill. Thanks, Michael. Um, actually, I'm going to throw straight to Cody uh, because he's got the first part of the presentation, but um, and then I'll be uh, adding some more information in the middle. And you know, going the wrong way. No, it's all good. <laughs> absolutely fine and uh, thanks to CASA for hosting the uh, seminar today which is is fantastic. Uh, from our perspective Jill and I are going to tag team throughout this presentation. Um, I'm going to touch base on some of the safety data that we're seeing within RAOs um, that obviously not only applies to the RAOs cohort but general aviation in general um, and Jill's going to talk to some of the points and uh, and what we can do to avoid such situations. So uh, in terms of introdu uh, introductions, I'm Cody Calder. I'm the head of safety at RAOs, where I've been for around about four years now. Prior to that, I was flying charter work uh, overseas in Fiji and New Zealand, and uh, I'm joining from Darwin. And we've got Jill Bailey. Yeah, thanks, Cody. Um, I've been with RAOs 11 years, uh, head of flight operations, and started off as a RAOs pilot uh, eventually ended up running my own school at Tamora, which is where I still am, in the heart of uh, aviation land. So um, handing back over, Cody. Thanks, Jill. So to get started, I just wanted to touch base on some of the data that we're seeing within occurrences reported through to RAOs. So taking a look at our five-year data, we've seen 170 airspace-related accidents or incidents of which 56% of those occur during flight training operations and 44% uh, occur during private operations. Of those 170 airspace related occurrences, 89 were related to separation or near miss occurrences in non controlled airspace. So 74% uh, of that 89 occurred within the, the circuit. So, quite a large segment of those airspace related occurrences uh, are related to near miss or loss of separation. And uh, of those, a near miss event was also a contributing factor in at least one fatal accident that we've seen within RAOs. So breaking down our near miss or loss of separation events uh, a little bit further than that, out of the 89 events that we've seen and had recorded, 33 of those involved procedural issues, 13 involved conflicting circuit directions, 
11 involved gliding, parachuting or helicopter operations, 7 involved incorrect frequency or a failure to communicate, and 6 involved overtaking in the circuit. So what we're seeing from those and most occurrences may have been avoidable uh, through improved radio communications and uh, in these occurrences that we've had reported, all aircraft were equipped with radio. So whilst it's not always mandatory for all of our aircraft to have a radio all of the time, uh, from the occurrences that we've seen in terms of loss of separation or near miss events, all of those aircraft were fitted with it, uh, a radio. So when we look at that data and, and break down where near miss events are likely to occur, we see that they occur most frequently at airports with increased traffic density, uh, also at airports with differing aircraft uh, types and different operations. So gliding, parachuting, helicopters, IFR, warbirds, a mix of operation types increases the likelihood of, of encountering a near miss event and also airports in close proximity with another airfield or in quite complex airspace. So that map there is a breakdown of, of the key points where we've seen those occurrences over the last five years. And as expected, uh, they, they tend to occur on mainly on the J curve and in that more complex and, and high dense uh, traffic areas. We'll pass over to Jill. Thanks, Cody. So what I wanted to talk to about um, was just a little bit of detail about the types of RAL's operations that you might expect to see at a non-controlled aerodrome. And so the photos down the bottom just give a bit of an indication of the wide variety of performance types that are possible to have RAL's registration. Um, so in general terms, most RAL's pilots will fly quite close to uh, the runway and maintain gliding distance where possible. So they've got a risk management strategy um, of, uh, of staying close to the airport, quite close to the runway. But uh, surprisingly, a lot of our aircraft have quite new avionics. So uh, the comments and questions earlier about uh, the RPT operators maybe not having ADS-B in um, may not be the case for RAOs. We have actually got quite um, modern avionics and um, it's not a disrespect to our counterparts in the RPT world, but um, uh, that avionics can give, or those avionics can give quite a lot of um, um, clarity and situational awareness to our pilots. And also the approach speeds uh, may be surprisingly high for some of the RAL's aircraft as well. So if we talk more generally about, or more specifically about things um, like the powered parachute aircraft, so uh, they'll generally do a, a circuit around 300 AGL, so quite low, uh, that's perfectly legal. And they'll be obviously very close because their glide ratios are two to one, three to one. So um, not particularly great uh, glide uh, operations. And they'll be uh, mainly operating early in the morning or late in the evening uh, in calm conditions. Whereas the weight shift micro lights, which are the middle category of aircraft there will be between 500 and 1000 AGL in the circuit. And again, remaining within gliding distance, um, but can operate in stronger winds. And the three axis aircraft, the one on the right there is actually one of the high performers in the RLs world. So the aircraft might operate from a 55 knot cruise speed, uh, approach speed, sorry, cruise speed to a 200 knot cruise speed, um, which is really serious uh, moving in the RLs world. And the approach speeds might be anything from a 35 knot to an 80 knot uh, approach speed. So there's a massive variety um, in the RALs world of aircraft types. Um, and uh, and as a result, it's, it's quite confusing and quite, um, quite hard to necessarily pin down what speed those aircraft might be doing. Um, if we can go to the next slide, Cody. We talk about um, uh, typically what we expect of our pilots when operating at circuits and uh, it's not quite as easy uh, as it is in potentially the um, uh, airline world where we can perhaps uh, require SOPs, um, but certainly the expectation from RALs is that RALs pilots will operate in accordance with the, the requirements of um, Part 91 um, and uh, soon to be Part 103, uh, and certainly with any of the requirements for radio calls, circuit procedures, etc. So what, what can we do as RALs pilots to help manage these um, mix of complex uh, aircraft operations at non-controlled aerodromes? The first thing to do is to, to prepare. And uh, the five Ps is the perfect example of, of what we expect. Um, the considerations that you might consider uh, might uh, include as an RALs pilot would be things like whether there's going to be passenger transport operation at the airport, um, whether there's any gliding, parachuting, 
any circuit training, warbirds, helicopter operations, any emergency aircraft, including HEMS and, and other um, helicopter and fixed wing operations, and aerial application, because we know these are the sorts of things that occur at non-controlled aerodromes. So when you're tracking inbound towards these airports, having done your uh, pre-flight planning and, and worked out what type of air, uh, aircraft operations you might have, um, you will obviously need as an RALS pilot to make sure you've got the correct CTAF frequency. Uh, and they are changing. Um, uh, I think uh, Ben mentioned earlier Ballina. We've got some very uh, recent changes to CTAF frequencies in that area. It's a very busy area for uh, transiting and training aircraft. Um, and there's absolutely no excuse for not being on the correct run uh, circuit uh, frequency, CTAF frequency, when we've got uh, things like Oz runways and Avplan available to us, which are updated pretty regularly. Um, use your AWIS. So use the uh, information that's provided at the airport to work out what circuit would be the most likely with the prevailing winds and plan your circuit a long way out to do that. Um, and the other important thing is to make sure you've got a sterile cockpit. Uh, let's borrow that from the uh, bigger airline uh, operations. When you're coming into an airport, let's not talk to our passengers and let's not get distracted with other things. Put away the EFB, put the eyes outside, listen on the radio and make the appropriate calls, build the picture of, of what sort of traffic there might be. And particularly if you're listening to that traffic, think about what the other pilots are going to uh, expect or need from you, which is a perfect segue into the next slide. Thanks, Cody. So the, the key, I think, when we're talking about effective communication is to think about what that other pilot and that other aircraft is going to need to know about your operation. Um, and the, the key thing is obviously communicating. Uh, so making the calls, don't be afraid to, to, um, to make those calls on the CTAF frequencies. Um, but the, the key thing I've learned from Andrew and Ben's presentations is uh, the, the prevailing straight in approach that will happen with, uh, with our RPT uh, operators is easier for them uh, to manage, safer for them to manage. And actually in some respects can be easier and safer for us to manage if we're aware of that uh, process. So in terms of planning, um, our pilots could also consider looking at timetables for when those operators are going to be uh, flying in and out of those non-controlled aerodromes. Maybe you can delay your uh, approaches or departures away from those times, which will just reduce the circuit congestion at that time. Um, and don't forget, it could be your family sitting on that um, aircraft. Um, so you're obviously going to want to give them all the courtesy and, uh, and space they require to operate safely. But uh, reading URSA and uh, calling the ARO, the Air Airport Reporting Officer, and, uh, and considering whether you could extend a leg of the circuit perhaps to assist the RPT operators to move um, in and out of the airport safely. When we talk about other uh, operations, things like gliding operations, um, obviously uh, during competitions, you can end up with quite a gridlocked airport um, where uh, gliders are being uh, taxied out, towed out to grid up and depart. And likewise, when they're coming into land uh, during a competition, they might be coming in quite fast and, and um, uh, quite focused on getting across that finish line. Uh, obviously, communication there is the key as well. Um, and I don't know if anyone's uh, observed a, a winch launch um, glider operation. It's pretty exciting and there's a pretty high rate of, uh, of climb in those uh, aircraft as they're um, uh, going up on, uh, on winch. So um, being aware of those sorts of operations, um, the thermaling operation that will then occur um, at, uh, as a result of the glider bunging off and, uh, and ending up trying to find a thermal to, to move away. Um, and the, the best thing you can do there as an RLS pilot is to obviously read the NOTAMs because the NOTAMs will tell you when there's high intensity operations for paragliding, gliding, uh, any of those types of operations. And moving on to parachuting, uh, often there can be a lot of periods where nothing seems to be happening while the uh, aircraft is climbing to altitude to throw the parachutists out. So, uh, and then everything starts happening um, very quickly. There can be parachutists in the air and uh, they can actually also uh, operate through cloud um, when and approved. So um, it's, it's obviously a good idea to give the uh, airport a lot of space at the time when there's parachuting operations going on. Um, and the, the parachutists uh, require, the call, pilot is required to call, let you know how many canopies are away, when they're away, um, and they're made, required to make those calls on area and CTAF frequencies. So if you've got dual radios that you can monitor those two frequencies, it can give you a great situational awareness uh, on those operations. 
Uh, likewise for circuit training, well, we've got to expect different size circuits. We've got students that are struggling to manage the aircraft and all the things that happen in a circuit. Um, so they may fly quite wide extended circuits. You might have powered parachutes or hang gliders uh, or um, weight shift marker lights operating and doing quite tight circuits. So there's no one correct size. It's the appropriate size for the aircraft operation. Um, we need to make sure that we're aware as pilots of where those uh, circuit operations are, are taking place and to remain courteous and professional. Just because we're not paid to, to fly as pilots doesn't mean we can't be professional about how we interact. Um, and we also need to remember we were all students once and we we're all fumbling to try and manage the aircraft, make calls, work out what's going on with the aircraft uh, and keep situational awareness. And likewise for instructors, it's quite, quite challenging at times to keep an eye on what the student's doing, manage whatever it is they're attempting to, to complete and manage their own situational awareness. So uh, if circuit operations are going on, just be aware obviously of the increased uh, workload for uh, for those instructors as well. Um, and helicopter training obviously is going to be doing completely different uh, circuits and often um, what might appear to be contrary circuits or conflicting circuits. Um, and we just need to be aware of those as well. When we're talking about operating with warbirds in the circuit at non-controlled aerodromes, there's generally issues for warbirds that are very similar to what happens for RPT or passenger operations. There can be visibility issues, particularly on the ground. They can also have overheating issues if they're delayed, so they might become quite um, antsy about getting off the ground because their uh, motor's overheating. And then if they're performing during the air show or at a fly-in, they may actually be doing demonstrations and therefore abrupt manoeuvres um, or unexpected manoeuvres. So um, again, read the NOTAMs, be aware of what the activity is and perhaps plan to be uh, not in the air at the time when those activities are taking place. And finally, uh, aerial application pilots uh, are, uh, are very uh, focused on getting that, uh, that task completed. They might take off downwind. They might take off and not really climb to much more than treetop height. That's all perfectly legal from their perspective, um, but they are required, as we are all, to uh, make communications clear to other pilots. So uh, that's one of the key uh, areas. Again, I think we, if we had one word to win the, the day for uh, operations at non-controlled aerodromes, it would be communication. Let's talk to each other and make sure we're aware of what's, uh, what's going on. And I think my final slide is talking about how we can manage uh, the mix of GA, which includes RAOs and RPT or, or passenger operations. Excuse me. So, again, considering um, their operations and planning your operations uh, to give them plenty of space um, and to consider what they need, which is obviously clear approach paths um, without much ability to do manoeuvring. Um, so if we can be a little bit courteous and professional there, extend legs of circuits or, uh, as I said earlier, decide not to fly at that time potentially. Um, and communicate, communicate, communicate. I think that's probably the uh, the buzzword from Andrew and Ben. Um, you know, there's no need to not talk to these pilots. In fact, there is an incredible need to talk to them. Um, and they are just pilots, just like us. And a lot of them actually fly a lot of RAOs or gliding um, aircraft anyway. So uh, they're very familiar with what we might be trying to achieve. Um, but yes, the, the key message, I think, is also if they give an inbound call, don't believe because they're 30 miles out that it's going to happen you know, quite slowly. They'll be in the circuit before we even realise. So uh, again, uh, keeping awareness of the approach speeds and differences and the weight turbulence considerations. So we recommend you look at uh, AC9116 talking about weight turbulence and managing uh, those issues. Um, I guess when you're talking about sharing operations with um, RPT, uh, don't do the unexpected. Don't try and sneak in on a runway at a, a low uh, a low altitude or uh, a fly a big circuit. Don't all, but don't do non-standard things. Um, and broadcast your positions relative to uh, the locations in quadrants and altitudes and directions uh, rather than over Fred's farm. It's just like an IFR waypoint means nothing to a VFR pilot. Fred's farm really won't mean anything to an IFR pilot flying into that airport. So uh, the importance of those standard operating procedures, um, uh, they're all outlined in the Part 91 General Operating Flight Rules in the Plain English Guide. Great publication from CASA. If you haven't read it, you really should. Um, uh, and there's a whole heap of other advisory publications as well. But uh, the, the important message, I think, is do the expected thing, do the standard thing. Don't do a non-standard approach process or uh, don't 
be tempted to do beat ups or other things uh, while there's other traffic around. And uh, the final point I wanted to talk about was the alerted scene avoid. Um, because there's no requirement to actually make specific calls, as in you must make call X or call Y, you are required, I think as Terea pulled up earlier, to make the call that's required to avoid uh, or reduce the risk of collision. So don't assume because there are no calls that you are not uh, dealing with other traffic in that circuit. Uh, make the calls that you believe are appropriate, uh, your inbound calls, your um, joining circuit calls, etc. Um, and don't avoid using the radio. They're fitted to aircraft for a purpose. They increase the uh, um, and improve see and avoid by alerting people as to where you are. Once you've made that call, listen out for who's going to respond because the worst thing you can possibly do is, is not respond to someone who's asking for more information from you about where you are. So handing back over Cody. Thank you very much, Jill. And uh, just to wrap up before we finish, I just wanted to take the opportunity to have a couple of uh, have a look at a couple of case studies uh, of real life examples. Now, obviously, uh, these are used as as learning opportunities uh, and not to apportion any blame to anyone involved in any of these occur these occurrences. So, the first occurrence I wanted to have a look at was on the twenty eighth of November. A Jetstar A three twenty was conducting an approach to land at Ballina. At the same time, an RAS Jabiru was transiting from Heck Field through to Evans Head. Uh, the two flight paths intersected 12 nautical miles southwest of Ballina with a vertical separation of only 600 feet and no lateral separation. The ATSB conducted an investigation into this occurrence, and what they found was that the Jabiru pilot was not aware of the location of the A320 until their paths converged. Likewise, the crew of the A320 was also not aware of the Jabiru aircraft until they received a TCAS alert. Both of those aircraft were on the CTAF frequency and both of those aircraft had also made radio calls, though neither aircraft recalled hearing the radio calls of the other aircraft. Now, the contributing factors that the ATSB established from their investigation was that the transponder on the Jabiru was not selected to transmit altitude data, only position data, which limited uh, the visibility and awareness uh, of the A320 to get a, a picture as to where the Jabiru was operating and what altitude they were at. And also, the pilot of the Jabiru aircraft did not recall hearing broadcasts from the A320, and the flight crew of the A320 didn't recall hearing the broadcasts from the Jabiru. So since this event here, uh, air services have implemented a surveillance flight information service or SAFIS at Ballina. Ballina now has its own specific radio frequency and other CTAFs in the area also have updated frequencies and radio calls at Ballina are now mandatory. Uh, since the changes of those airspace, we've also had additional occurrences at Ballina where pilots have transited through the area without making the appropriate radio calls um, as uh, pilots have been unaware of the, the changes in that airspace. So really what this occurrence here highlights is the importance of, of obviously planning, uh, communicating, uh, which both aircraft were communicating, but also listening out. And, and even if another aircraft is not necessarily making calls for the same destination aerodrome that you might be going to, listening out, really building that picture as to where another aircraft is and where they might be transiting in relation to your position. The second occurrence I want to touch base on is in relation to light aircraft movements at Kabulcha. Uh, which occurred on the 28th of January 2021, where an aircraft or aircraft A was downwind for runway 1 to Kabulcha Airport. Uh, there was also another aircraft that was downwind ahead of that aircraft, um, which was conducting wide circuits. So the aircraft behind communicated with that pilot that they intended to pass on the inside of them in the circuit for a close base to land number one. Now, in doing so, that aircraft conducted the passing manoeuvre on the inside of the other aircraft. But what they didn't do was identify that there was actually a third aircraft in the circuit that was established on final for runway 12. As a result, that aircraft became established on final directly above the other aircraft. And uh, thankfully, what occurred was there was another pilot in the circuit that uh, identified that there were two aircraft descending on final, one above the other, and was able to alert those pilots of that matter 
uh, by communicating with them over the uh, over the radio and um, and the aircraft conductor to go around. Now, our review of that matter uh, identified that aircraft A uh, conducted a non-standard procedure by passing the other aircraft in the circuit. Um, they also didn't identify that there was another aircraft established on final and uh, the aircraft that was on final was also identified as not making regular radio calls. So what we see often with non-standard procedures in the circuit is they do put people uh, in, a, in a situation where they're not expected or you might lose situational awareness in terms of the full picture as to what's going on. Standard circuit procedures and altitudes are obviously in place to best protect aircraft from an air mess and collision. Uh, deviation from these procedures greatly increases the likelihood uh, of being seen and increases the likelihood of an air mess event. Clear two-way communication always greatly increases situational awareness, but lookout is ultimately the last line of defence. Uh, it's really important, like Jill mentioned, when you're in the circuit direction, whilst there's a host of technology that might be able to aid in our situational awareness, by the time we get to the circuit, we should be putting that technology away. Uh, we should be briefed on what the procedures are for that aerodrome. We should have our eyes outside, uh, really looking for any other traffic and obviously communicating well in advance and whilst you're in the circuit uh, to best build that situational awareness as to what might be occurring. Just finally, for those who aren't aware as well, uh, the Australian Government does currently have uh, an ADSB rebate program with grants of up to $5,000 available to eligible aircraft owners to fit ADSB equipment to their aircraft. Uh, for more information on that initiative, uh, go to business.gov.au and search ADSB. Handing over to Jill. Thanks, Cody. So the conclusion, I guess, uh, if we wrap all that together, is uh, is we really need to consider what other pilots need from us. So it's not enough for us to just make a call and assume that that answers all questions and addresses all situations. So what does that other pilot need from us to make sure they're safe? And just because you've made a call doesn't mean that that means that the end of the conversation. It would be uh, silly of us to think that there's no need for further communications. And as Cody identified earlier in those other incidents, uh, failure to follow up on initial calls uh, could have been part of the factors for why that uh, loss of separation occurred. If you make a call and then don't listen to what happens afterwards, um, it's almost pointless making the call. Uh, and finally, planning your flight, because if you can't understand what it is that you uh, uh, need to manage, then there's no way you can manage uh, the situation appropriately. You can't manage something you don't expect to see, in other words. So avoiding distractions, looking out, listening, communicating clearly, um, maintaining standard procedures and avoiding distractions in the cockpit. So put away those lovely devices, as Cody said, look out the window, listen on the radio and uh, and be clear about it. So I think that's uh, our presentation. Thanks, Cody, and uh, thanks, Michael and Casa, for the opportunity. I hope it's been a benefit. If you've got questions, there's our email addresses. Um, and uh, obviously, it looks like there's a few questions piling up, so I'll hand back over to Michael. Thanks, uh, Jill and Cody. Um, again, great, great presentation. Um, to those two people that are waiting to ask uh, verbal question, your questions verbally, I'll Thank you for your patience. I'll get to you very, very shortly. Just a quick uh, question for um, Jill and or Cody is most recreational aircraft, um, do, do they get uh, um, encouraged to uh, use things like landing lights or nav lights, anti you know, collision strobe lighting when they're operating around a circuit? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, most or a majority of RAL's aircraft have anti-collision lights, strobe lights. Um, there's a, a, a significant proportion that have landing lights and the uh, AIP recommendation to use those in the circuit is certainly something RALs expects pilots to follow. Thanks, Jill. That was great. Um, Landy, would you unmute, please? And um, I'll take the first question, I think, from uh, very patient William. Are you there, William? Would you like to ask your uh, call? Question, rather. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we've got you now. Oh, OK, thanks. Um, yes, thank you very much to all the uh, present, uh, presenters for a fantastic uh, presentation program. Uh, my back background is mainly from um, high capacity uh, RPT operations, but uh, I've flown into 
non-controlled um, aerodromes. My question is, is there, and forgive me if I've missed it along the way somewhere, the, is there any consideration given to uh, pre-entry into the um, non-controlled aerodromes with regard to traffic information from ATC and for on-route traffic I'm talking about, not to localise operations? Uh, perhaps I could um, help answer that, uh, William. Um, if you're operating under the VFR, no, generally not. If you're operating under mm. the IFR, yes, you'll get what they call directed traffic information um, that uh, ATC consider could be any uh, yeah. uh, traffic that, that potentially will conflict with you either, uh, you know, one route or um, at the uh, at, at the destination or in, indeed from yeah. the airfield you're departing from. Oh, sorry, I forgot. I, I should have uh, elaborated on that. But in the interests of VFR traffic, I understand that. But would it not be? I've done it myself. In VFR traffic, request from air traffic controller. They're in or ATC services. And they request traffic information for such and such an airfield, uh, and they'll provide it on that. But they're not obliged to. But it has to be on on the pilot's request, as opposed to IFR traffic. Yeah, that's a pretty fair statement. Um, I think that it and it'd be workload dependent from an air traffic mm. services point of view. Yes. If the FR were to request uh, traffic, um, it would be considered by the ATC, but it'd be um, the response would certainly be um, workload uh, permitting from that point of view. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, just as a you know for, uh, help for the uh, deterrent or deconflicting situ uh, uh, situation developing. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Right. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, Brian, I believe you um, had your hand up second. Would you like to ask your question? Maybe Brian is not there. About TDM solutions, anybody there uh, with uh, a raised hand would like to ask a question? Uh, yep, you hear me? Yep, we have you loud and clear. No worries. So the name's Trav. Um, sorry about the naming convention. Um, I, it's more of a, it's less of a question uh, per se, and something that I have come across both as a pilot and a parachutist is with the uh, the component of wingsuiting uh, as a discipline within parachuting. Uh, it's quite often that in certain conditions, uh, a, a wingsuiting uh, exit or dispatch at, at whatever height usually you know, will seek to get maximum. So, you know, 15,000 uh, AGL, or oh, sorry, ASL um, without O2, um, is that we, we can be up to one and a half and in certain conditions, two and a half miles uh, away from the aerodrome if that is being used as the drop zone. And I find that that is that, that has caused um, some issues and things like that in the past, where most people understand, especially if it's an established DZ, uh, DZ that a, a jump run is generally no more than a mile long uh, at all. So um, sure. I, I, that's just something to point out there, and um, yep. since we talked about it, but uh, sure. I don't Thank know anyone's feedback on that. The question component of that is there have been times where uh, both as a pilot and a parachutist, I have found some of my uh, broadcasts and some of my communications with RPT to be uh, less than cooperative um, when already established in the jump run. Um, and like, so we're stable and we have uh, parachutists you know, exiting. Um, you know, things like that. Uh, I suppose like, that's. I don't. I, is there any sort of established procedures, whether it be you know, version quarters, something like that, where you guys are like, okay, you know, obviously we don't want to delay you or anything like that, but we also don't want to create an incident. Um, you know, and that goes with some of our dealings with um, like, uh, emergency services and rotary wing. Like, obviously, you, uh, you know, they've got to get away, but the last thing that we want as operators or anything like that is a is a rotary wing aircraft, especially at a place like Maria, where you know, Westpac is 50 meters you know to the south of the drop zone itself or to the um to the hangar, and we've got parachutes in the air and they're starting up. Like you sit there and you know, you wring your head, uh, wring your hands. So 
I'm not yeah. sure whether there's a like an established protocol beyond you know what the, the existing rules, which don't really provide much in the way of, of I suppose authority to be able to you know, demarcate. Yeah. It's just a matter of broadcasting. I think I don't think there's a specific procedure for it, but um, it's really comes down again, I think, to the um, uh, alerted seeing avoid procedure, um, you know, based on broadcasting and uh, and then and then see and avoid. Um, there probably wouldn't be a lot more uh, uh, to uh, the procedure than that standard type of, you know, application um, when you're operating it around uh, an uncontrolled aerodrome or you know in the in the vicinity. Of um, such of one of those, um, and I'm sure that the, the, the air transport uh, operators would uh, be doing their best to cite and avoid um, that type of conflict as well as they would be looking for um, for other other conflicts that uh, that might be around. But nothing specific, I I, I, I would think. Um, but look, thanks for your um, thanks for your um, uh, question, um, Neil Deerberg. Do you have a uh, question for us? OK, Neil, that seemed to be with us. How about um, uh, Veld, Will and Vel? Yes, do you have a question? Yep, can you hear me? Yep, I do. Um, I'm a, I'm a, a tail dragger pilot flying up and down the coast in Western Australia. I had a T TCAS activated an aversion flight when I was pa passing through Geraldton at 5,000 feet. I was one zero miles south of the, uh, the aerodrome. And they were coming in, coming in on an 03 instrument approach. Um, that incident aside, as a private aircraft pilot, I'm trained to go to the CTAF 10 miles out, go to the, back to Melbourne Centre after 10 miles. In that RPT area where it's they're quite often there, should I extend that? Is there a bit, I suppose for Ben and Andrew, is there a better way I could do my radio calls around that area? Yeah, I'll jump in first if you like, Ben. And yeah, no worries, man. Yeah, um, yeah if you can monitor the CTAF for works radio wise for you, um, just beyond that that 10 miles, I think that improves everyone's situation awareness. Um, but I think the second part of that, um, it's something that Ben mentioned in his presentation. I didn't, it's it's a requirement for the IFR traffic to broadcast on the area frequency anyway, um, when they are about to leave control of airspace on the sending. So, You'll hear Virgin, you'll hear ourselves, Jetstar, all give a, a broadcast on the area frequency. And we're not doing that because we like the sound of our own voice, like some people seem to think. Um, it's because we've got to relay that information onto the area frequency for people maybe like yourselves that are just outside the CTAF and, and hopefully you do pick that up. Um, understand it can be a little bit tricky as well. Um, when I last flew a Tiger Moth, I only had the one radio. Um, so I don't know if it's the same setup you, you do. But I think it really just depends on on the local aerodrome. But yeah, maybe if you can start monitoring a bit before the ten miles, and um, and then yeah, if you are inbound, if you think the ten miles is appropriate to make that broadcast, I think that's a good thing. Yes, your presentations, both of them, have been really helpful to understand why now. Now I really understand how that occurs in that area, and and yeah, just making that change and staying on the sea taff will be an extra couple of miles because when I'm at ten miles, they're only just reaching my cruising altitude, aren't they? Yeah, and it's a good point, even on approach and departure operations. I mean, um, I didn't mention earlier, but and the Q400 has got a similar performance outbound as well. And we talked about arrival procedures. We tend to get up and out pretty quickly um, due to the performance that we have. Um, you know, it's not uncommon, certainly at Ballina off 06, it's not uncommon for us um, to be crossing the coast, heading east for noise abatement and passing, you know, 3,000 feet. And if we turn back to intercept outbound, it's not uncommon to be up at 7,000. So when you're looking at those sort of distances you're talking about at Geraldton, as we said, we're, we're dual comms equipped. So anything you can say, be it on the area frequency or the CTAF, should be picked up by the crew because they would have been monitoring it for a long time prior to coming in. So just mm -hmm. because you're at 10 miles and on the cusp of the CTAF doesn't mean that you can't make it a general area broadcast as well to let, especially if you're aware that the airplane's coming in, because the crew will pick it up because they're generally listening to both frequencies. Well, that's interesting because this particular incident, I did make the 10 mile call that I was departing the CTAF. Um, yep. And when we were debriefing after the TCAS, 
via the radio. Um, they, they hadn't received that call, so I assume that they oh, hadn't okay. pushed over yet. Yep. So they, they do monitor two radio, radio frequencies, it's good. Yeah, we have to have, yeah, they, they have to have monitoring on both the area and the CTAF, so, yeah. All right, thanks very much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you um, for that. Um, we've been going for just over an hour and a half now. I think we'll um, close the meeting um, or seminar there. Thanks for the questions, um, both verbal and uh, in the chat line and the ones that were sent in prior to the seminar. Um, up on the screen there now, you'll see I've got a, a, a slide on the Pilot Safety Hub. And if you go to casa.gov.au forward slash pilots, that'll take you to the Safety Hub. And uh, over time, you'll see uh, these types of webinars that have been recorded um, being placed into the appropriate uh, area there. And it's currently divided up into, into four topics, the first two being uh, controlled aerodromes, and the next one we'll be uh, addressing will be uh, weather and forecasting. So when you go into the Safety Hub, you can go to the appropriate area uh, and find the information that you are after. Um, my thanks particularly to all of our uh, present presentations uh, this afternoon, fantastic great uh, advice given. I hope uh, people that have uh, joined us for the seminar this afternoon have got a lot out of uh, the presentations that were given and the questions and uh, answers that have been um, provided. So thank you so much to uh, everybody. Keep your eye on social media and we'll be doing um, a few more of these in terms particularly of the short series webinar along the uh, very same lines as uh, the ones that we've uh, done to date. So thank you very much. If you're interested in a face-to-face -face seminar, please check the CASA website uh, for the AV safety program that our aviation safety advisors uh, conduct and will be out and about over the next 12 months with a seminar on operating at uncontrolled aerodrome. So if you'd like to join us for that, just check the CASA website for the closest uh, seminar to you. Uh, on that note, thank you so much uh, for joining us and uh, we'll see you next time.